Thank you, Anita. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you all today as director of the Robart Center for Kenyan Studies for this important talk. Um, before um, I talk to you a bit more about the Robart Center, let me start reading uh, York University's land acknowledgement, which is where the Robart Center is located. We recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Odnoshni Confederacy, and the Urawenda. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon's Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. The Robart Center, as Anita was saying, is one of the four uh, legacy institutions created in Ontario in memory of former Premier and also former Chancellor of York University, John Robarts, for whom education, either formal and public, was a key pillar for the success of the province and of the country. Uh, the center was created in 1984 to foster a study of Canada and to foster the study of Canada, and it has evolved since then to become a core research node for a critical, collaborative, and interdisciplinary study of Canada. We have more than 150 faculty associates, including Dennis, uh, from across 10 faculties of the university. So our work is wide reaching, um, but there's always been a keen interest in using critical insights developed by the scholarships of our members to inform public debate. Professor Pilon's work fits very well this definition and this goal as debates to electoral reform, the voting system might seem by some as inaccessible or impossible to touch. This is why we're very happy to co-sponsor this event today, which is based on a written policy uh, intervention that Professor Pilon published with us in our flagship uh, publication, Canada Watch, which has been around for since 1992. And I'll put the link in the chat right away. Thank you so much. And I turn it back to you, Anita. Thank you very much, Don Michelle. Really appreciate uh, Robart Center co sponsoring this. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. So, for those of you uh, then for whom Dennis Pilon is a new name, he has been um, a leader in this field for decades. He was working on it uh, long before I was, and uh, you know, this is a life, a life work for him. So Dennis is an associate professor at York University, one of Canada's preeminent experts on voting system reform. He has written numerous journal articles. If you go on York University website, you can read them all, very long list. Newspaper articles, book chapters, and books, including the politics of voting, reforming Canada's electoral system, and wrestling with democracy, voting systems of politics in the 20th century West. All right, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dennis. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anita, uh, for that introduction. And thanks to Fair Vote Canada for, uh, for wanting to put on this talk. And uh, of course, thanks to the Robart Center uh, for agreeing to put the paper out, uh, responding to my, my suggestion that this would be a good uh, a policy intervention for the center. And they just jumped right on it and have made it happen uh, very quickly. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's um, uh, the paper itself is, uh, I think there'll be a link somewhere. If you haven't already seen it, you can you can check it out. And of course, let me thank all of you for showing up tonight. Wow, over 300 people uh, signed on uh, to the talk. Uh, I, I, you know, I honor your, your willingness to come out to this. Uh, you've obviously got lives, uh, and yet here you are uh, to hear me. So I hope that uh, what I talk about tonight will be of interest. Uh, we'll throw out some stuff that you can use in our day-to-day -day struggle uh, to get a more democratic voting system in this country. Uh, let me share my screen because I have a, a PowerPoint that I want to, uh, let me just see where it is here. There it is. Um, and uh, now I will choose slideshow. Now, let me know if, if any, sometimes glitches happen in Zoom with PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so just let me know if the slides are are moving. Uh, if they're not moving, I guess, you know, let me know. Like, I'm going to switch the slide now, and hopefully you see presentation themes. And these are the themes that I, I want to take up. 
Um, obviously, I, I'm not going to be able to go into all the detail of the paper. Uh, the paper, yeah, frankly, I go on and on. You know me. Uh, and so, uh, but but what I'm trying to do in the paper is provide ammunition resources. Uh, we've all heard the kind of off-the-cuff responses uh, that sound like they're informed or have something to them, uh, and and uh, and frankly, they they don't have anything to them, and that's the point of the paper. Um, you know, it's one thing to hear politicians swat away the topic with self-interested uh, uh, rationales. It's another to see the media uh, fail to get into the depth of the issue because, frankly, they can't be bothered, or they don't actually see it as being in their interest either. Um, but it's another to see academics. Uh, take up some of these false narratives or reinforce uh, ways of understanding the issue that are just not helpful. And uh, and it, it's a bit of a, it, I, I, I don't get it, uh, you know, why they end up where they do, uh, but I felt that I needed to put in one paper a kind of one-stop approach to say, okay, you know, how is this being talked about uh, amongst people who should be informed? And where are they making mistakes? What is faulty in their logic? Uh, and so these are the themes that I want to take up. I want to talk about how we talk about voting systems. Uh, I want to talk about what I call fake values versus real voters. Uh, the fake values are the values that a lot of these political scientists put forward, suggesting we need to include in our discussion. And I say they're fake because there's really no evidence to support uh, the idea that they're important to anyone, as opposed to what the real voters are actually doing. You know, when we look at what real voters are doing, we get a good sense of what they're trying to accomplish. And that's that's what should inform our discussion. And then I take up this referendum issue and whether or not, uh, you know, referendums are the right way uh, to take up how to change the system. Spoiler, they're not. Uh, and I've got some some rationale, some reasons, some some backup for why I think that is the case. So let me talk about how we talk about voting systems. And this will be familiar to some of you uh, who have been involved in this. Uh, if it's not familiar to you, then uh, sit back and I'll try to give you a kind of greatest hits of, of what's been going on over the last 10 years as we have seen this topic um, uh, come out again and again, despite various efforts to sort of you know put it to rest. Um, so what I talk about is how the dominant approach in political science is this, what I call the preference approach. Uh, and the preference approach holds that the point of voting system reform is to assess the competing values that different voting systems allegedly represent. I say allegedly because I don't think there's any evidence to actually support the idea that they do. Um, and they, they make these claims about the values based on the results that the systems typically produce. Uh, and then they suggest that the, the debate about voting systems is then really just a matter of deciding what you prefer. You know, do you prefer majority government? Do you prefer local representation? Or do you prefer uh, accurate results? Um, and as I say, this is the way that most academics, media analysts, and politicians talk about voting system reform. And I compare this to what I call the democratization approach. And in the democratization approach, we recognize that there never was a moment when we sat back and said, hey, what's the best way to do democracy? Instead, what we have seen over the last 150 years is a long uh, and partial struggle to make our political institutions that predate the democratic era into more democratic institutions. And that is as yet an unfinished pro project. Um, and it's one that has involved struggle against those who would prefer that things not be that democratic. And so in this democratization approach, the point is to recognize that the way forward is to look at what voters are trying to do when they're voting, and then assess what institutional approaches will best help them get there. So we don't judge institutions about what we prefer. We judge institutions on the basis of whether they work in terms of these uh, the democratic struggle that people are, are trying to, to get done. And how do we decide? We decide which of these approaches is the right one based on evidence. You know, is the preference approach backed up by evidence? Um, if it isn't, then why are we using it? That's my that's the gist of my my talk. And ultimately, again, spoiler, uh, I think that the evidence is very much in favor of the democratization approach. That's where we'll see uh, the the evidence supporting. Um, okay, now there we go. Um, so 
the problems with the, with the preference approach, as I've suggested, is that there really is no evidence supporting its major claims. What we hear typically is people say things like, um, uh, the preference approach uh, is based on these four different uh, preferences, uh, simplicity, stability, uh, representation, and accountability. Those are the four themes that we often hear uh, people who use this preference approach, the political scientists who draw on it. These are the four themes that they, they take up. And I want to take up each in turn, starting with simplicity. This is not a hard one to grasp. And I, as I say, I'm, I'm going to run over these fairly quickly um, because uh, obviously there's a lot in the paper and I'll take up some questions in the question and answer. And some of the questions, you'll just have to have a look at the paper if you really want to know uh, a, a bit more. So on simplicity, we're told that a uh, single member plurality system is simple, PR is complex. And so uh, allegedly people will make a decision on the basis of what they prefer more, simplicity or complexity. Now I challenge this by demonstrating that PR systems are not actually that complicated to use. Um, uh, when we look at evidence about complication, one thing we can look at is what I call ballot spoilage rates. In other words, if a system is complicated, then we would expect people to make mistakes in using them. But what we discover in looking at both SMP, a uh, single member plurality system and PR systems is that their ballot spoilage rates are comparable. In other words, it doesn't appear to be any more complicated to use one system over another. The other interesting thing about this is that while our voting system is, is fairly simple to count, it's not actually simple to understand. Uh, and we know this by looking at surveys of voters around this question of majority government. Um, in surveys, in fact, surveys that have been conducted at different times, um, they, they've had a fairly consistent result that up to half the people surveyed thought that when you said we had a majority government, that meant that a majority of people supported the government. But of course, I think as many of you know, that's not the case. In fact, it's almost never the case that a majority of voters in Canada give their support to just one party. On stability, again, it is alleged that our single member plurality system is stable while PR systems are not. Again, you know, when we look at the evidence of what actually happens in different countries, um, we find that we can find examples of stability and instability in both cases, single member plurality and PR, and that over the long haul, both systems have been stable. Um, one way we could test this is to look at how many elections uh, have been held in the different uh, places. And again, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, if, if a country was too unstable, we would expect them to go back to their electorates more often, right? Can't hold the government together, coalitions are breaking down, so we've got to have another election to sort things out. But when we count up the number of elections across Western countries, we find that there are no more elections in PR countries than there are in SMP. What about representation? This is probably the greatest hit uh, of the defense of our current system. We are told that our current system is based on this idea of local representation uh, and that it's absolutely essential. Uh, people really love it. Um, and uh, PR systems are going to wreck this. They're not going to have local representation. Well. What we can discover by looking at the facts is that almost nobody votes on the basis of a local represent a local representative under our current system. Almost everybody votes on the basis of party, and we know this by a number of avenues. Uh, we know it because people who run not with a political party are rarely ever elected. Uh, if they are, they're almost always former members of a political party. Um, we know from some survey work that has asked people their opinions, you know, how important is a local member to you? Um, people said, oh, yeah, it's, it's important to me. Uh, one survey found 40% of people saying the local member was important. But when they asked them a follow-up question, uh, yes, but what if the person's not with the party you support? Well, now only 4% of people were prepared to say that the local member was important. We also know that politicians don't act on the basis of locality. Uh, when we look at the votes in parliament, Almost 99.5% of the time, uh, uh, MPs vote with their party. Uh, and so, again, this, this claim about local representation uh, is, is very much that, a claim. It's not backed up by what either voters or the politicians uh, are doing. On the other hand, if you really think local representation is important, it's not like you can't have it in PR. We have lots of PR countries that have significant local representation. What about accountability? 
Here, uh, defendants of our current system say that the, the single member plurality system and the fact that we have regular legislative majority governments, that creates more accountability, they say, than PR systems. Uh, they say it prevents buck passing amongst the coalition partners. Uh, they suggest that under our current system, it's the voters who decide who will be the government, and uh, the government doesn't emerge from negotiations, as may be the case under PR. Again, you know, the evidence here is not strong for this claim. Uh, the notions of accountability that we're supposed to believe take place in our system don't make a lot of sense. Uh, for instance, we're supposed to believe that voters who support party left are going to be able to make that left wing party accountable by voting for party right. That just doesn't make logical sense. Um, and yet those are often the only choices that are available to to voters. Um, uh, it's also not clear that the kinds of governments that we get under PR systems are not accountable. Um, we see uh, parties working together. Uh, lots of voters can understand those relationships amongst the parties. Uh, and we see uh, those governing coalitions change in PR systems. So uh, we definitely can see a kind of accountability uh, taking place in those systems. Well, what I'm arguing is that the preference approach doesn't actually provide any evidence uh, to support the claims. They tell us that we need to take these things into consideration, that, that, is, uh, that these are fair and equal, both systems are good, uh, so really it's just what people prefer. But when we look at the claims of the preference approach, they're not backed up by any solid evidence. By contrast, I argue that what we need to do is look at what voters themselves uh, do when they vote. Uh, we could ask voters their opinions, um, and they might tell us lots of interesting things. But the most solid information we have is how voters vote. And, and there we can see that voters uh, regularly and almost always vote for a party. Uh, and that's what they're trying to get when they are uh, voting in an election. And they're fairly consistent uh, in those, uh, those results. Despite all the rhetorical focus on local representation, uh, the local doesn't trump people's party support. And the party support reflects uh, the values that they have, uh, the kind of policies that they would like to see uh, the government uh, introduce. And these tend to fall on a spectrum of sort of a rough left to right, not in a clear ideological way, but more in a policy way, right? Some voters uh, are against abortion and some are for abortion. And voters are very good at figuring out which parties are closest to the policies that they support. Uh, that's what people are voting for uh, when, they, when they get involved in an election. Um, and so uh, when, when voters vote party, it's a kind of what we call collective action. Uh, they're trying to get a result in line with a whole bunch of other voters. Obviously, other voters are also voting, and they're hoping that by voting with other voters, supporting a similar party, uh, they'll be able to get the kinds of policies uh, taken up by the government that gets elected. All right, well, uh, even if one might accept my claims that the preference approach is wrong and a democratization approach is right, an approach that, that puts the focus on the struggle to try to bring democracy to our institutions, it still doesn't answer the question of how do we get there? Now, we've seen an answer over the last 20 years, uh, and one answer is that, well, we need to go to a referendum. Uh, a referendum is the right way, the just way, the democratic way uh, to make a decision about uh, the voting system. Uh, in fact, we have some, particularly on the political right, who argue today that it's, it's, uh, it's almost a convention now that we must have a referendum. Uh, and they react very strongly at any suggestion that we shouldn't have a referendum. And so I want to take this up because I, I do think that there's a lot of the key claims are not backed up by any kind of complex thinking or evidence. Uh, and when we start to look at this question a little more carefully, we discover that uh, there are a lot of reasons not to take up the referendum approach, that the referendum approach, just voting on something doesn't make something democratic necessarily. Uh, we've got to ask some tougher questions. So let me just run through each of these questions these claims. And again, in the paper, I, I go into quite a bit more detail, and it's probably a little easier to follow. Uh, but I just want to give you a sense of, of what some of the arguments are that appear in the paper itself. Uh, and so for each of these claims, I go into a, a kind of counterclaim, uh, taking up uh, the arguments. So the, the first claim that I look at are 
the claims around majoritarian decision rules and representation. Uh, those who call for referendum feel very confident that it is the most democratic approach. Uh, because they think that putting the rules of something to a vote uh, makes, you know, a kind of logical gut level sense. Um, you know, when you're voting on an issue uh, in a parliament, sure, voting makes sense. You know, you have some discussion, some debate, deliberation, but at the end of the day, you got to make a decision. And so then you have a vote and you vote something up or you, you vote it down. When we're talking about representation, that's a very different thing. Um, representation is about bringing everybody to the table. Uh, and in a, in a political system, uh, obviously, if, if people can get enough support to ask for some representation, if enough other people agree with them, then it's not clear that allowing other people to say that shouldn't happen is democratic. And that's essentially what the referendum approach does. Uh, the history of referendums have some pretty dark chapters on this question of representation. Uh, we have seen again and again, historically, uh, dominant groups in society use referendums to deny other groups their representation. Um, so we saw, for instance, in the American uh, South, uh, and not just in the American South, the use of referendums to deny uh, African Americans their voting rights. Uh, to give it a veneer of democracy. Uh, we saw in, in the Canadian context, the use of referendums to attempt to deny uh, different groups of people their voting rights, Asian Canadians and women. Um, in Switzerland, women were denied the vote until 1972 uh, by use of referendums. Uh, so it's not clear that referendums are a fast track to democracy. Referendums are an instrument that can be used for both uh, democratic and anti-democratic purposes. You've always got to look at the context uh, to ask yourself whether or not using a referendum is the right choice. Uh, and on lots of kind of moral normative grounds, it certainly is not. What about this automatic link of voting system reform and referendum? Uh, the, the idea here is that uh, there's some sort of logical historical link between the two. In fact, referendums uh, are rarely the, the way in which new voting systems have been introduced. Um, in fact, when we look at Western industrialized countries, uh, only Switzerland prior to the modern era used a referendum to introduce its voting system in 1919. Um, new Zealand uh, is the country that we most associate with the referendum, but we've had other recent voting system reforms in uh, France in the 1980s uh, and in Italy uh, a number of times since the 1990s, uh, and they didn't use a referendum to introduce a new voting system. Uh, Japan introduced a new voting system in the 1990s, didn't use a referendum. So it's not automatic uh, that you use a referendum. What about uh, the arguments that we hear about who is uh, proposing the referendum? We, we, we hear often that a referendum is a way to get around partisan interests. Uh, it's the most fair way of taking it out of the politicians' hands. What this ignores is that uh, the introduction of referendums or the calling for referendums, uh, both in the past and in the present, has been highly partisan. Uh, when you get into the weeds of the New Zealand situation, it's very clear uh, that there were strong partisan interest in uh, fomenting the use of a referendum and trying to use a referendum to actually stall the process um, in, 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 at various levels of the process in New Zealand, which took place over a 20 year period, um, uh, various politicians tried to rig the game against change. It didn't work. Ultimately, uh, New Zealand did in fact change its voting system. But what's fascinating is how Canadian politicians were paying very close attention to New Zealand. And so they uh, learned from New Zealand's mistakes, uh, as they would see it, uh, and made a number of key decisions. For instance, the introduction of a, super, introduction of a supermajority rule in British Columbia, and then later in Ontario, and initially in PEI, definitely partisan. Uh, so those who are calling for a referendum, particularly today in Canada, the, the strongest proponents are very much on the political right. And they do so not because they see it as the most fair uh, and open way, but because they think it's the best way to prevent change from occurring. What about uh, the arguments for referendums on the basis that the voters uh, have some strong opinions uh, that should be registered uh, in something like a referendum? Uh, that the referendum, in a sense, uh, puts the choice uh, in the voters' hands. Um, 
and that is not backed up by the research on referendums. Um, what we know from studying referendums is that voters often suffer what we call an information deficit. Um, they, they, they find it difficult to get enough information to, to participate in the details of the policy. And it's not their fault. And they're busy. They've got lives. Uh, and and the, the, the processes and the details of policies are often very, very complicated. Um, and so what they do instead is they basically take an information shortcut. They look for partisan cues uh, to make the decision about how to vote in a referendum. In the most recent BC referendum in 2018, very clear, right? Uh, voters not terribly well equipped uh, or informed. Uh, but what we saw was uh, how voters look to political parties. So the irony is, is the referendum is supposed to take it out of the hands of the parties uh, and give the voters the direct charge. But instead, what voters do is basically turn back to the parties. And so the decision in BC reflected the organizing of the BC Liberal Party, who promoted the referendum as an almost existential crisis for the supporters of the BC Liberal Party. Uh, and so they were very successful at, at mobilizing enough of their supporters to vote against changing uh, the, the, the voting system. So, um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, uh, what we're supposed to be seeing with this referendum is not what actually happens. Um, what about uh, uh, the idea of values? Um, you know, that, that, uh, that the voting system that we had reflected certain kinds of values and, you know, a new voting system would reflect different values. Uh, often we hear, particularly political scientists, uh, use this idea that the voting system in the past was chosen for normative reasons. You know, Canada and other countries decided on first past the post um, because it creates majority governments or it has local representation. Again, the idea that the people who made the decision were sitting there weighing up, you know, these sorts of values. And when we look at the actual historical story, it's just not the case. Uh, the actual historical story is is much nastier. It's 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 very much about self interest. Uh, uh, the the people who are in a position to make the choices are strictly thinking how will this benefit me? How will this benefit the people I answer to? Usually, of course, very moneyed and powerful people. Um, they're not interested in whether or not it's good for the people. Uh, they're interested in whether it's good for themselves. So this this attempt to project these values into the past is historically inaccurate. Um, and it tends to skew the discussion uh, as if somehow um, the complaints that are being made about the system are somehow justified because they reflect an alternative group of values. Uh, the reality is that uh, our institutions reflect their undemocratic origins. Uh, the people who started the game uh, were interested in keeping control of it, not including as many people as they could. Now, they were at various points forced to open up the discussion, forced to include new people, but they never said, hey, and while we're doing it, let's rework the, the, the rules. No, no, they, they were very clear that they were going to open the door a little, but they were going to keep the rules the same if they thought those rules would continue to benefit them. And that's how we end up in the predicament we're in right now. Uh, it's not that you know the people have chosen these systems. Uh, it's that they've ended up with them. They've ended up with them because uh, it, it's what the powerful, the organized uh, have wanted. And the last thing that I, I talk about in the paper is, is the idea that referendums somehow are offering a fair choice. Because ultimately, if you go along with what I've said, which is that the preference values aren't really values that anybody's acting on. Uh, nobody is really making a decision on the basis of uh, locality or majority government or representation. Um, well, then the only issue is really whether or not we think our voting system should be more representative or not. Should our, should our, should our approach to democracy be more inclusive or less inclusive? That's the question that a referendum is asking. And it, right off the bat, it just doesn't seem like a very democratic question. I mean, in a, demo, in a democracy, representation is key. That's the very first step before you can have a discussion, you've got to have everybody at the table. And so basically to say to people, we're going to give you a chance to choose the undemocratic option is 
just by definition, a not democratic choice. The way I put it in, in, a, in an op-ed in the Vancouver Sun uh, before BC decided to uh, have a referendum um, in uh, in in 2018, uh, I basically said, look, this this stuff about the referendum is coming at this the wrong way. And so I said, think about it this way. You arrive at your neighbor's house for a friendly game of cards, but at the door, he tells you that the other players have decided that you'll have to score twice as many points as anyone else to win the game. But hey, it's all above board, he tells you, because, you know, most of the players voted in favor of that rule. Now, does that make the rules fair? Is it fair that everybody else voted to make it harder on you so that's a democratic outcome? Of course it isn't. Nobody would play a game under those kinds of rules. And yet this is basically the argument of those who insist on a referendum. Let me conclude. The details of voting systems uh, matter, but not as much as the reasons that different groups support or oppose change. How we talk about voting systems matter, and our theme is solely about more democracy and inclusion. Uh, that's why we're fighting for voting system reform. Attempts to introduce other values into the discussion are either a distraction or they're just a different kind of politics. Uh, they're not supported by facts, and so either someone is trying to rubbish the conversation, distract us, confuse us, or they really just don't know uh, the facts uh, about how people are making choices. And then I've made the case that referendums are not the way to make institutions uh, more democratic. Uh, referendums are at best um, uh, sometimes the right choice uh, to make a decision, uh, but they're not automatically a more democratic choice in all cases. Let me see if I've there, I've got one. For those of you who are interested in finding out uh, more, and obviously I've run over a lot of stuff here tonight, uh, you can go to my Academia EDU site where a copy of my book uh, and copies of my chapters and articles are available. Uh, and you can, you can contact me uh, with questions uh, arising from tonight if we don't get to all of them in the Q&A. So there we go, that is... Uh, my talk. I realized it was an awful lot of information. I ran over things fairly quickly, but hopefully in this discussion, uh, you can get some clarity or you can raise some other issues you want to talk about. Thank you, Dennis. That was great. You covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time, and I hope everybody will take the time to read through Dennis's paper. It really is just excellent, and it's a good summary of the kind of conversations that we see on electoral reform in the media who get it from academics, which sort of skews the whole thing in the wrong direction, which is why we're lucky to have Dennis here with us. So I'm going to uh, go through a few, to, a few of the questions that got asked in the Q&A. There was a lot of questions, so it's a little hard to prioritize them. Um, so they're sort of coming in no particular order. So this one is, how do we out lobby the corporate lobbyists? And basically, it's, this is a theme I see coming up in a few of the different questions. They're saying, okay, um, how is PR going to address this, the power of corporate lobbyists, the power of monopolies, that kind of thing? What's the relationship there? Well, I mean, I think that many of you know that none of us are suggesting that, you know, changing the voting system is some kind of magic bullet. Uh, and, you know, everything's going to be, you know, truth, beauty and justice, you know, once once we get this. But it's a different way in which people can fight, negotiate, deliberate, talk, uh, share about politics. Uh, and, you know, the countries with PR, they have lobbyists, uh, they have powerful forces, you know, trying to get their way. The difference is they don't have the leg up that our powerful forces have in Canada. First past the post gives them an incredible advantage over the average voter um, because they can send their lobbyists, uh, you know, they can have them work in the phones and meeting with politicians and giving money in various ways through various channels to political operatives and parties to try to get what they want. And, you know, they're operating in the shadows for a reason. You know, it's precisely because they're pretty confident that maybe if Canadians knew the kind of stuff they were trying to get, that Canadians wouldn't want it. So that's the key thing. The key thing that PR would change is that it would break the back of phony majority governments. It's the phony majority governments, the governments that end up with a legislative majority and an unstoppable ability uh, to introduce whatever the heck they want, usually what a majority of people don't want. Um, uh, and instead, they have to have a bigger coalition supporting what they do. 
And that doesn't mean that governments won't do bad stuff or introduce wrong policies. Uh, it doesn't mean there won't be lobbyists, but they have to work a lot harder in a PR system as opposed to our system. So I have another question here from Robert. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the gist of it is he's saying, what is the best number of parties in a proportional government? He says, he thinks if there's any more than five parties, um, things could get a little chaotic. And I was wondering if you would address that. Well, this is really an, what we call an empirical question, right? I mean, we should look and see what happens in countries that are comparable to Canada. And so we often look at Western Europe, we look at countries like New Zealand, and we say, well, what's happened? Right? That's the best way to try to get a sense of what is possible. It's not like those countries are exactly like us, but they're they're sort of similar in terms of their economic development and their, their political development. And what we see in looking at these countries is that, you know, coalition governments sometimes have got five different parties, you know, maybe maybe a big party and some smaller parties. Other countries, maybe only two parties are the parties that are forming uh, a coalition. Uh, some cases, they, like us, sometimes have a minority government that is ruling. Um, so really, it's a question of, you know, what are the customs in the country? How do the politics break down? What kind of, of um, uh, deal can be struck amongst the different parties? I mean, it looks to me when we look at the facts of how long the governments last in these other countries, uh, regardless of whether it's two parties or five parties as part of the governing coalition, they appear to be able to hold together. You know, they don't they don't look like they have to go back to the public any faster uh, than we do uh, to try to, in other words, they have the ability to act and carry out different policies. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that that's the way we would we would assess that that question. Look at the facts. Look at what's actually happened in those countries in the post-war period, and we, we see kind of a range of different details. I would just add to that too. You know, if you look at different indexes of democratic quality around the world. Some of the countries that come in consistently on every index at number one, two, three, four, and five are countries like Denmark with, I think, 14 elected parties. <laughs> and they are the top of the world for pretty much everything. And then you have countries like New Zealand that also score fairly high, and they tend to have four or five parties in their parliament. So again, it's like Dennis is saying, it's what do voters want, but the outcomes that we're getting in terms of a better kind of government um, it's going to be good with proportional representation. This is a related question from Catherine Doucette. She's saying, as the number of parties increases, as we we're sort of seeing in Canada, as is happening here in Quebec, six provincial parties, is the need for PR more pressing? You know, it's interesting because we often hear the critics of PR say, oh, we don't want PR because it'll create more parties. Um, What's interesting historically is that PR usually follows the increase of parties. It doesn't precede it. Um, and so it's it's precisely when the dominant parties come under threat that they become more amenable, more interested in talking about voting system reform. When it appears that they can no longer serve their function, you know, which is to get all of the power. Uh, because with all of the power, they can do all kinds of stuff and nobody can kind of stop them or keep track of them until they're booted out of office. Um, so that's where we start to see these changes. Uh, and so I say to people, you know, if you want to see PR in the Canadian context, uh, more parties is a good step forward. Uh, we've never heard so much discussion as when the party system starts to become less stable. Uh, because that's when the coalitions within the parties start to raise some questions. You know, remember when the Harper conservatives were in power and the, the liberals uh, had been uh, turned back to, to third place for the first time in their history. Never did we hear su such a diversity of opinions within the liberal party. And half of the caucus actually voted with an NDP motion to introduce a PR system federally. So it, it's exactly that kind of dynamic that will open the door to politicians taking this sort of thing more seriously. Um, but sure, I mean, the more parties we have, the more obvious it is that the system is not doing its job. The voting system is a communication device where the people speak. And it's what's the message we're getting with our voting system? They're not being heard. 
So of course, the, you know, the Quebec is just a, a poster child for everything that's wrong with our current voting system. Uh, you know, parties with roughly the same support getting wildly different seat counts, uh, a party with far less than 50% of the popular vote getting an overwhelming majority of the seats. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see how, how wrong, you know, this is. Um, but so the part of it is a shame game. Part of it is delegitimizing. You know, these, these results are not legitimate. When so many people are not getting what they vote for, something's wrong with the institution. That's our message. All right. I have a number of questions here that are along the same line, Dennis, uh, which is basically, how do we get there? And I'm going to give you the longer version of that one from Riel. Clearly, politicians are in a conflict of interest when it comes to electoral reform. If so, how can we trust them to lead the charge? A referendum is not the way to hand some power to citizens. If a referendum is not the way, what would be a better way so we are not entirely at the mercy of self-serving politicians? Well, you know, I want to back up because, you know, we often hear about self-serving politicians. We kind of picture maybe Monty Burns steepling his fingers, plotting the downfall of humanity. Um, you know, politicians have got an agenda. That's why they run with different parties. And some of them answer to different people, you know, different influencers. Uh, and so it's not just them. It's not just them acting on their own, right? It, they reflect actual things going on in our society, power struggles that are, that are going on. Um, and so we have seen politicians change the voting system in Canada, right? We've had 10 provincial voting system reforms, 10 successful changes of a provincial voting system, all conducted by politicians, all handled within the legislature with a simple majority vote. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the time is ripe and they feel threatened, uh, they'll act. Uh, you know, we've certainly seen that in the past. I mean, ideally, I do think that we can bring genuine values into the discussion. And the values that matter most are the democratic ones. Representation. How can we honor what people are trying to do by voting? People fought for that vote. Right. I mean, you know, women fought to get the vote. Working men fought to be included. Uh, you know, uh, Asian Canadians, South Asian Canadians, you know, fought to get the vote back after it was taken away from them. So we should honor that. Um, you know, we should honor it uh, by having a system that really reflects uh, what they've said. I think a citizens assembly uh, that is appointed uh, to try to figure out what is a made in Canada approach. That sounds like a great idea. I, I have every faith that they would produce uh, really good results. Uh, wherever we've seen citizens assemblies, we've seen, you know, honest average folks who are given the resources do fantastic work. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that is, that is a great way to go forward. Now, of course, it relies on the politicians agreeing to let them make the decision. Uh, lot, there's lots of ifs and buts in there. How it might come down, uh, there are a number of different things that might come to pass, number of different paths. Okay, one is that, yeah, everything gets so illegitimate that finally the politicians uh, agree to what we think is the ideal process, you know, commitment to change and use the Citizens Assembly to work out the details in the same way that we use independent boundary commissions, you know, to make decisions about riding boundaries, unlike our American friends, you know, who let the politicians uh, draw them. So that's one approach. Another approach would be uh, some sort of chaos or crisis that then opens the door for change. Uh, you know, some sort of, of uh, behavior on the part of an existing government uh, and maybe an opposition that suddenly, you know, both have an interest in leveling the playing field. Uh, and certainly that was the case historically, that historically uh, World War I opened the door, uh, you know, the mobilization of a lot of, of, of people who've been left out of the discussions, that forced it onto the agenda. Um, we see a strategy being employed right now. We have a charter challenge that is going to come to the Ontario courts uh, this fall, uh, and many people feel that that offers an opening. Uh, it's an interesting strategy. It does come with risks. Uh, and so the charter challenge is going forward, um, and the, the thinking is that the challengers will be able to convince the justices that the politicians are in a conflict of interest, uh, that the evidence is so overwhelming that our current system doesn't do the job. So ipso facto, the justices will step in and say, okay, you need to make this change. And they look to things like court cases around the boundaries uh, that were used provincially, like BC's electoral map was struck down via a court case using the charter to say that the differences in the constituencies was too big. It was, it was affecting the equality of the vote. 
The problem with that approach is that the courts have also shown themselves to be not terribly well-informed historically on this struggle side of democracy. Uh, and so they've accepted a lot of stuff at face value that isn't actually very well supported uh, historically. And certainly their decision in the Senate reference case is worrying. Because in the Senate reference case, you may recall, they said that Stephen Harper couldn't change the basis of appointing senators because the Senate was part of what they called the constitutional architecture of the country. And the risk here is that they may say the same thing about the voting system. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why they won't. I mean, if you look at the Confederation debates, they're all about the Senate. They're obsessed with the Senate. Um, I mean, they spend two thirds of their time debating the Senate. What do they say about the voting system? Nothing, not a word. Nothing is uttered about the voting system in the Confederation debates. But what's worrying to me is that the justices would say that, a, that an institution designed in an undemocratic era somehow holds in a democratic one, which is what they've essentially said. They've said that this constitutional architecture that was put together basically by wealthy railroad sponsored plutocrats, um, that it is more important than what we might say right now about the kind of institutions that we would want. That's my worry about that approach, but I guess we're going to see uh, how it goes forward. So far, the courts have basically said, we're not gonna get involved. This is a provincial issue uh, or a federal one. Um, and so they basically, basically they've said, this is within the powers of the different uh, legislatures to decide, and we are not going to intervene. So that sort of then pushes it back into our court. Yeah. So, I mean, I just like to say, you know, our, our good allies in Fair Voting BC and Springtide are bringing this case for the Charter's uh, challenge forward. It's the second attempt. Um, they believe they have a strong case. We're really glad they're doing it. And a lot of our uh, supporters are supporting them because it's all one movement. So if you look at Fair Vote works on pushing up through the political end, we're pushing for citizens assembly, we're pushing for proportional representation using political moments, and they're working out on the legal end, it's all complementary. We're all working together toward the same end. Um, I have a couple of questions in here about ranked ballot, which is great because that shows there's some new folks uh, that are joining us. So Dennis, so someone's saying, what about a ranked ballot? Okay, so you know, sometimes when I do this talk, I, I do a little mini uh, intro to PR, PR 101, uh, where I basically outline that there are three kinds of voting systems and every voting system has three parts. Um, and so when people talk about ranked ballots, it's kind of funny, you know, because they're really just talking about a part of a number of different voting systems. So if you think about a voting system, every voting system has got a districting rule, every voting system has got a, uh, a voting structure rule, and every voting system has got uh, a formula. So the districting rule tells us how many people will be elected in a given area. Is it going to be a single member riding? Is it going to be a multi-member riding? You know, our provincial and federal elections are single member. You know, elections to Vancouver City Council are multi-member. Then uh, they have a... Um, a rule about how you indicate your support. And either you can make an X on the ballot or you can rank your ballot. And so, um, so that's a feature of a number of different voting systems. And then the last question is, how much support do you need to win, right? What's the formula? In a plurality system, you just need more than everybody else. In a majority system, you need to get a majority of the votes cast. In a proportional system, you just get a proportion of the total, the overall total. So. The way you mix those three elements together, you get different voting systems. And so the ranked ballot can be a proportional system like single transferable vote, which is used in Ireland, or it can be a majority system like the alternative vote or so what is sometimes called ranked ballots, uh, which is used in the Australian uh, lower house. You know, the problem with the ranked ballot is that while it appears to offer a way out of strategic voting, um, it doesn't offer a path to better representation. So it is at best a kind of Band-Aid over a bad system. Uh, and, and you know we have lots of evidence to suggest that it, it doesn't lead to good outcomes in a number of different ways. It, it depends on where you see the problem, right? For me, the problem is representation. You know, I think in a democracy, the very first step is representation. If I, I mean, I'm, I'm suggesting that if you're going to have an approach where not everybody's in on every decision, you're going to have some representation, then the quality of representation is absolutely paramount. And you're going to address that with PR, but you're not going to address that with the alternative vote. 
The alternative vote it, it often leads to just as skewed results as first past the post in terms of how it represents parties, in terms of how it represents ideology, in terms of how it represents our diversity, women, uh, um, you know, people of color, you know, however we want to define it. So in that sense, I, I don't see the ranked ballot as a solution uh, to the problems that I've outlined and, uh, and the objectives of Fair Vote Canada. Um, but of course, there are others who promote it as a, as a kind of band-aid over the worst excesses of our current system. So just for anybody that's new, if you go on our website, fairvote.ca slash rank ballot, you will find all about the problems of the winner take all version of ranked ballot and why Fair Vote Canada doesn't believe that it's any better and why we don't believe it's a step to anywhere except uh, two party monopoly that we pretty much have now. And also, if you go under proportional systems on Fairbrook's website, you will see systems like single transferable vote, which is a proportional ranked ballot. And you can see how, if you like to mark your choices and be able to rank candidates and have that maximum control over what individuals get elected, there are systems there that you will like that are proportional. I want to um, ask one that uh, Sherry's asked. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's specific about Manitoba. But basically, you know, she's talking about basically a two party system where a party that in theory should be in favor of PR because they're sort of a democratic left leaning party is not in favor of PR. And some of the reasons that she hears is, well, you know, it would give small parties too much power. Can you address that that uh, argument we get from big party politicians? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, I would, this would always I, I just, you know. I don't know. I, I, it's imagine you're sitting around with your friends and you're, you know, you're trying to figure out a movie that you want to see. And, you know, there's 10 of you and four of you want one movie and four want a different movie. And, you know, someone's arguing, well, the two who are left out don't deserve a say because, you know, they'll have too much influence on the result. I mean, you know, if you don't have the votes, you don't deserve to run the whole show. That's the bottom line. And the argument that somehow uh, you know, different groups shouldn't have, I mean, I mean, what this amounts to is these groups shouldn't have any influence. That's what they're really saying. You know, what we're saying is that everybody deserves to be represented. And then they'll work out what kind of influence each group should have. And there's lots of evidence uh, from Europe, um, Western Europe, where, uh, you know, Parties, big and small, work together to try to balance out the influence. And smaller parties know that they can't make uh, too extreme demands. They know that. They, 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 they know from the votes how, how, how popular they are. Um, they know there'll be a backlash against them if they try to be too demanding. And there's actually some really interesting evidence uh, where parties that were too demanding were subsequently punished in the next election by their own voters. So. You know, there is a kind of fairness thing that kicks in uh, where, you know, the different groups try to figure out how much influence smaller parties uh, and larger parties should have. Don't forget that, you know, the larger parties are just larger small parties. You know, they're not majority parties. I mean, if they had a majority, they could just do what they want, but they don't. They don't have a majority, so they don't deserve all the power. And that's that's the code that, that you know, all these excuses that's the code. They're just basically saying, I don't want to have to work with anyone else. I don't want to have to listen to anyone else. We're the biggest group on the block, so we should get our way. Well, I don't think that's the way democracy should operate. Okay, I have a couple of questions here. They're a little bit different, but they're along the same theme, Dennis. It's about the media. So one of the questions is asking about the role of the media in referendums and how do we deal with that? Another person is asking, how do you engage the media in telling the story of first past the post? Well, you know, I mean, I wrote a paper on this uh, about, you know, were media doing the job? Because the the argument that uh, the political proponents of uh, citizens assembly plus referendum, their argument was, well, the people need to have a say that's important, you know, sort of putting the guise of democracy on, so, you know, we've got to let the people speak. And, you know, don't worry, we're not going to spend very much money, you know, to help people understand what's going on, but the media will do the job. 
So I looked at the media coverage uh, in Ontario uh, in their 2007 referendum to see if this was true. Did the media actually take up the cause? Did they present, uh, you know, reasoned discussions with facts? Um, you know, did, were they fair and equal in presenting different sides? No, 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 no. The coverage was low. It was unbalanced and tipped overwhelmingly in favor of defending the status quo. Um, they just didn't do the job. Uh, and so that is a challenge that we have. Um, and th the other difficulty is that the mainstream media uh, often don't know what they don't know. Uh, and so they tend to reproduce conventional views uh, that lots of people support. Now, of course, my talk today and my paper is aimed at political scientists, because even political scientists who should know better Right, they should. They're supposed to know stuff about how the political system operates, but they're very bad at history. You know, they're not bad at like looking at stuff that's going on right now and coming up with ways of engaging it, but they're really bad at explaining where institutions come from, and they tend to assume where they came from. Hmm, gee, these, we we got a lot of local writings around here. It must be because people like that. People want it. Yeah, that must be the reason that we use these single member writings. Nice logical connection, but it's not factual. That's not the historical reason that we use single member writings. It has nothing to do with what the public wants. It has everything to do with what the politicians historically at that time wanted. So all we can do is try to shame them. You know, we try to shame them by pointing out the inaccuracies, pointing out the mistakes, uh, you know, trying to put uh, things into the discussion. And we've, you know, we've succeeded. We have changed. Uh, we have forced, we've pushed back. And we forced media to do a better job on a whole host of things. The way the media talks about the issue today, while still terrible, is a lot better than it was when I started working on this topic 30 years ago, right? 30 years ago, it was the standard, you know, if PR means Israel, that's what you would hear. That, you know, if we introduced PR, we would become Israel tomorrow. That was, or we'll be Italy. That was, you know, standard kind of rejoinder. And we don't hear that as much anymore because of the work that, you know, Fair Vote Canada has done and, and people like you who've been out in your communities and writing letters and, and, and pushing back against those false narratives. So uh, this one, again, there's a couple of questions that are similar to this. Um, I've heard an argument that only um, first past the post or single member makes transformative change possible when it's necessary. Well, PR stimmies it because it almost always produces coalition. Can you discuss that? Well, I guess one would have to define what we mean by transformative change. Um, uh, the most transformative change that we saw during the 20th century was the establishment of, of, of welfare states, uh, which uh, addressed a whole host of problems that affected 80% of the population in their respective countries. Uh, things like unemployment insurance, uh, hospital insurance, medical insurance, uh, educational costs, um, uh, you know, to sick days, uh, you know, all, all those kinds of things were put forward in the early 20th century, but were batted away again and again uh, by governments uh, who, of course, were not listening to what people wanted, were listening to what, you know, the powerful wanted. What we see is that in PR countries, they went further and faster in terms of introducing welfare states that helped an overwhelming majority of the population raise themselves out of poverty and penury. Uh, and so to the extent that these countries are some of the most dynamic economies in the world, um, it is precisely because their governments have been able to act. So that's one of the, one of the key myths is that coalition governments uh, are not able to act. They are. We've got lots of evidence of, of governments in Western Europe introducing absolutely transformative change. You want to see where there isn't transformative change? It's in first-past-the-post countries. First-past-the-post countries have what we call uh, liberal welfare states, which is to say shallow welfare states, uh, fairly weak welfare states. Um, you know, the benefits and the programs pale in comparison uh, to the programs that are offered uh, throughout Western Europe. So I, I don't accept this empirically. I don't think the facts support it. Uh, I, I realize the logic, uh, you know, the logic is that the more people you get on board, the harder it will be able to come to a decision. Um, but I think that that's, that's very first past the post thinking. That's very all or nothing thinking. You know, the reason our politicians can't get along is because there's no incentives for them to do so. You know, if our politicians work together, um, then the headline 
uh, is, um, you know, so-and-so gave up something to so-and-so. So-and-so blinked. Um, and when they run an election, they, they're, they, can't, they can't admit they work together because they've got to defeat every single opponent in every single riding. It's a, you know, it's a to the death match. So they can't sit back and say, well, well actually, you know, our, our opponents over here did have some good ideas. And we, you know, we introduced some of them because that might be to say people should vote for them. And in our system, the parties can never, ever say that. So it's a very different kind of dynamic in the PR systems. In the PR systems, voters have a more direct relationship with their parties and the kind of results that emerge. And it doesn't cost one party necessarily votes to say that another party had a good idea or to work with that party on some uh, policies that overlap between the two parties. They may in fact see it as being in both their interests uh, to, to work together. So yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that the generalization holds. I just want to add to what Dennis was saying, you know, about this idea that, you know, we need the single party majority governments that can just get things done. And, you know, those of us in Ontario are seeing that same kind of first past the post mentality with the Ford government right now. I mean, why, why do we need city councils when the mayor can just get things done? I mean, power just gets more and more concentrated, right? And so sometimes it is actually true that they can get things done. Are they things that we want to get done? The one problem that first past the post countries, winner take all countries have is sometimes they get things done and then in four or eight years, they get them undone. And then we go sort of around in a circle with that. So it's, it can be transformative, but not always in a good way. And in the long term, maybe not always in the best way. And so Dennis brought up the example of, you know, long term, some PR countries have done better on creating a, a more stable social welfare net. You know, another example is climate PR countries are doing better, not wonderful, but better over decades on climate. And it's because of this sort of cooperative, incremental, improving kind of politics that proportional representation encourages. I wanted to ask somebody's question here. Um, it's not directly about PR, but I, I, I think it's worth um, hearing how it relates to PR. This is somebody talking about regional power imbalances and just concerns about one part one part of the country has all the power one region has all the power other regions have no power it sort of harkens back to this task force on national unity from 1979 can you just speak to how the voting system relates to that issue of regional grievances i guess well, uh, you know, there's a reason that people focused on regional politics have come back to the voting system again and again. It's because we are a regional country. Uh, there are different regional interests, uh, different regional needs that are distinct. Uh, and one would think that given that uh, reality, we would really be focused on making sure uh, that those differences were effectively represented, that they were represented, but not overrepresented. Well, our system is the worst at doing this uh, because it distorts the degree of passion for regional politics or completely underrepresents uh, those regional uh, uh, approaches. The other thing is that regional politics is seldom one dimensional. Uh, there's often multiple ways to take up regional politics. Uh, you know, in the West, both the NDP and uh, the Conservatives have a distinct uh, regional pitch on various questions, um, but they're not the same. Uh, and we would benefit from seeing both of those approaches be part of the discussion. So it's why the Task Force on Canadian Unity, which was responding to the election of a separatist government in Quebec in, the, in 1976, was saying, we can't wait anymore. You know, we, we can't delay on this. You know, we absolutely have to do a better job of representing our, our, our differences as a country. Um, and my favorite example is the, um, uh, you know, 1990s elections. Uh, where the results were so not what Canadians had voted for. You know, we came out of an election where the Conservative Party was reduced to two seats, even though they still had considerable support. Um, the, the West was painted Reform Party red, even though over half of the, of the votes in the region were parties that weren't for the Reform Party. Um, uh, more than half of the seats in Quebec were won by the Bloc Québécois, who wanted to take Quebec out of the country, even though over half of Quebecers voted for parties that didn't support the Bloc Québécois. 
I mean, talk about Oppositeville. You know, this, this, so yes, uh, a, a voting system that is more representative will reflect our regional uh, uh, political differences more accurately. Where people think that regionalism is important and they want to vote for it, it will be reflected. Where there are significant differences in taking up regionalism, that too will be reflected. And I think that's a good thing. Again, I think getting people to the table is the first real step in coming up with long-term solutions to our problems. You know, our problem right now is that, you know, the people at the table, they're not representative. So how can they fix the problems? How can they really fix them? Um, if, you know, longstanding uh, uh, truism of politics, if you're not at the table, you don't matter, right? You're not, if you're not present, then, then your issues are not going to be heard. And you know that's a, that's something that women have learned. It's what all different groups have learned is you've got to be at the table. It doesn't mean you're going to get your way, but you've got a better chance of being heard and being included if you're there. And that is the signal mistake that our current voting system makes vis-a-vis -vis regionalization. Uh, a better representation of regionalism will move us towards better long-term solutions to these difficulties. Okay, a few people are asking this question about. Uh, concerns of people not voting. How will PR help with the fact that the majority of people are not voting? Okay, here again, I think we, 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 we can't propose PR as a magic bullet. If we look at the averages of voter turnout, the averages of voter turnout in PR countries is higher, right? Seven to 10% higher than in first past the post countries. But at the same time, voter turnout has slipped in PR countries as well. So the issue of voter turnout is not entirely uh, coincident with the voting system. Uh, and the reasons that we've seen declines in voter turnout are more complicated than just the voting system. Now, there is some interesting wrinkles to the story. Uh, for instance, in New Zealand, uh, switching, to voting, uh, switching to a PR system didn't lead to an increase in voter turnout. However, the composition of the electorate did change. Uh, you know, those who had been traditionally left out who had been traditionally underrepresented, the Maori, working class people, women, people of color, um, they came out much more to vote. And so we saw increases in their voter turnout under PR. People who had been motivated by the ships going down, we could lose by a single vote, it's all or nothing. You know, they weren't as motivated under PR to come out to vote. So it's interesting that you saw increases with some and decreases in other, and they sort of erased the gains. So they, it looked the same, but it wasn't the same. The, the people who came out to vote were not exactly the same coalition. And to my mind, um, you know, bringing in those who had been outsiders, I think that was a real accomplishment. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should just sit back and, and, and go, well, fine, you know, those others are gone or they're not coming. I think there are strategies that we can take up. And moving more into the question of voter turnout, it's very much a class thing. The missing voters are distinctly poor and working class people. When we look at the 1950s, when we had, you know, 80% voter turnout, 75, 80% voter turnout at the federal level, the interesting thing there was there was a much higher proportion of working class people. Some political scientists say, oh, it's all about youth. It's young people. Well, that's not a very good answer because it's always been young people. Young people have always voted in lesser amounts than other groups. But what was interesting about the 50s and 60s was that of the youth who did turn out, more were working class. Now, we've done studies of college-educated youth in Canada, and actually, there have been increases in voter turnout amongst college-educated young people. However, the gains have been erased by losses amongst working-class young people. So that is the challenge, and part of it has to do with the fact that parties don't mobilize voters in quite the same way that they used to. Direct contact matters. Direct contact makes a difference, particularly with voters who aren't already motivated to vote. And so if we really are committed to this idea of getting more people to vote, then maybe as a nation, we've got to come up with a strategy that will put people on the streets, talking to people, directly connecting with them, going door to door uh, as a way of bringing people back into the electorate. Because there's a lot of evidence that um, you know, people who don't feel as confident about their political knowledge, don't feel the same sense of entitlement around politics, they're the ones who are missing and they need to be encouraged uh, to come back. So I have a question here about, would you say the frustration with the present system was part of the reason for the so-called freedom convoy? And do you see an escalation going forward? 
There's a big question. It is, that's a very big question. And I don't think we have enough research on the Freedom Convoy to really make any declarative conclusions at this point. I think initially everybody thought, oh, well, they're all just conservative voters. You know, they're all, they're all PPC voters, you know, showed up to the Freedom Convoy. But as people started to interview uh, some of the people there, um, they discovered that people had lots of different motives for coming. Um, you know, clearly, many of them were fed up with lockdown, fed up with masking, um, and, and they were out of sync with the overwhelming majority of Canadians who were prepared to go along. Um, and so it, it shows, you know, how a, a minority that doesn't want to participate can have an impact. Um, but yeah, what, what their political views are, that's a harder question to answer. Um, and it does appear that the PPC in the last federal election was able to mobilize people into politics who didn't normally participate, largely on the on the masking and the COVID uh, restrictions issues. Uh, the interesting question is whether they will continue to be mobilized. Uh, it does look like the conservatives are trying to appeal to some of those groups with some of their policy statements, um, but I don't know. I don't. I don't know if the sense of of crisis that was fueling, um, you know, the march on Ottawa will in fact uh, continue into the future. Um, so no, I, I think it, that's a that's a tough one because we really do need to do more research to understand that group of people. I, I mean, I would just add to that, Dennis. You know, we've had a lot of conversations in Fair Vote about the idea of big tent parties versus um, hmm. being able to be represented in your own party. And I think there is some frustration when you have a big tent party like the Conservatives or liberals or the NDP where there's such a wide variety mm. of views and some of those folks are feeling like they're not being good heard. Point. Yeah. Um, does a PR, this is an interesting question, does their PR system mean would we would be governed by the views of the average voter? <laughs> well, I mean, this is, um, you know, we often hear from some academics, they focus on what they call the median voter, which is to say, the group of voters who are closest to the center of the political spectrum. And of course, then that de depends on how you define, uh, you know, the different ends of the political spectrum. What is right? What is left? Where is the center? You know, you have people who say, oh, the liberals are a left-wing party. Other people say, well, no, the liberals are a right-wing party. And of course, there are arguments uh, for both positions. Um, I, I, you know, those who defend our current system say that the current system benefits the median voter. I'm not sure that the median voters should be privileged any more than any other voter. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, everybody in a democracy des deserves representation. Uh, I mean, clearly, maybe there'll be some things that we all agree, you know, uh, Nazis, you know, we're not going there. Um, but barring that, you know, we agree that different views should be represented. Uh, and then the question of, of who gets more influence will be worked out. You know, politics isn't a zero sum game all the time. There are questions that are more zero sum, you know, for or against abortion, there's not much room in between, um, but other questions aren't. And so sometimes a government can actually come up with a policy basket that offers things to a whole group of voters, right? The, the average median voter, um, you know, the, the voter who has a distinct view on the right or a distinct view on the left, um, it's entirely possible that a, a, a really representative government could do that kind of work. Uh, so I'm not, I mean, I, I get, I guess it depends on what we mean by the average voter. Um, uh, very few people want to claim to be average. Um, I, I, I put it into political science terms where they talk about the median voter, which simply means the voter closest to the center. Uh, okay, so I have another question here uh, from Lynn. Here in Ontario, and I, I think that this relates to a lot of different situations. So even though it says Ontario, here in Ontario, how would we get all the opposition parties to agree on a system to get implemented as soon as they are elected? Um, should we ask them to do a citizens assembly to choose a system? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, this is another. You know, I, I you know, I always appreciate the technical, uh, you know, the the, the down to earthness of Fair Vote Canada people because it's like, look, how do we do this? You know, how do we get it done? Uh, and that is good because obviously there are people who just want to noodle on about this stuff forever. And that's not me, right? I'm, I'm in this for the long haul because I want to see us get there. Um, and so this is a really good question. Um, you know, there are those who say that the politicians could cook up a PR system uh, and it would probably be fine. And to the extent that it was genuinely proportional, it probably would be. Um, and then, you know, if 
if it turned out that people didn't like what they cooked up in a PR system, it's much easier to make changes than in a first past the post system. And we have seen that occur in different countries, you know, where the initial system was seen as having some quirks that people didn't like. And so then they were able to force some changes uh, that were publicly popular. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of the citizens assembly approach. I think that that is a way of uh, of bringing some real down to earth, grounded uh, opinions into the discussion. I think experts have a role to play. I think that we can offer things into the discussion. But ultimately, um, you know, I think average folks coming back to those average folks. Uh, you know, I think we've seen again and again that if they're supported, they really can produce good work. Uh, out of a citizens assembly. And I think that's how we could put the wheels on this bus, you know, in terms of, of, of saying what kind of PR system should Ontario have? What PR system should PEI have? What PR system should BC have? What PR system should Canada have? They could all be different, you know, depending on what people decided, um, you know, the people who are going to use it uh, and live with it, uh, what they thought, you know, was important. I mean, I would say too that there's a certain amount of realism that has to come into it because when people say, well, why don't you just get the, you know, let's say there's the conservative government, right? And then the other people are saying, why don't you just get the other parties to just agree on a system? Like, like it's so easy. Why don't we just get them to agree on a system? Like we've tried that for like 20 years. So sometimes it's more like, what's a realistic next step that would help make our movement stronger? that would build credibility, that would build trust, that would give us tools to push the politicians more. And a citizens assembly fits that bill. Directly trying to get parties that like Dennis said, this dynamic in the first past the post where they hate each other and whatever the one says, the other one hates it just because they're the other one. Trying to get them to agree on a particular system before an election, really hard. You know, so the citizens assembly is a nice way where people with different politicians with different points of view can set that aside and agree to a process. Sometimes that's a little bit easier than getting directly to cooperation. However, if they came out tomorrow and said, hey, guess what, Anita, you know, my phone rang, you know, we've had a meeting and decided <laughs> that we agree on one PR system. Yeah, we're, we're in, okay, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Not at this point, anyway. Um, I am seeing, let's see, people are asking about, you know, the things going on in Ontario and how we can use those things that are happening that people are very upset about. How can we use those things to advance the, the proportional representation cause? I, I do, you know, we always use the raw material at hand, which are the elections, okay? You have come to this thing tonight because you're special. You know, you have an interest in this topic that's pretty arcane. Um, so you're already, I hate to break it to you, but you're already part of the geek club. Um, and that makes you different than almost everybody else out there. So if we want to make inroads, if we want to catch people's attention, then we've got to talk about the things that people care about right now, that's right in front of them. And that means the provincial elections, the federal elections, Donald Trump, whatever, right? Like, we, you know, we use whatever the raw material is available to try to, you know, wheel, you know, to lure people in, like, you know, look, there is a connection between what you care about and this institution, and we think we can do better. And so, yeah, I think that the fact that the premier has 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 doubled back on a host of promises that he made, particularly around the green belt, um, you know, the, the 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 damage that he's done to Toronto City Council. I mean, it's a circus how he has carried on interfering with an election uh, representation during an election uh, and now reducing the power of, of council. I mean, how there's no way to characterize this as any is, is in any way democratic. And if John Tory, you know, were doing his job, he would refuse to take up these these responsibilities. He would he would say that this is not what the people want. You know, they want me to be mayor, but they they don't want me to be you know, mega mayor uh, and have mega power over the other councillors. I mean, you know, this is the same party that makes a big deal about local representation. And, you know, with this law, they've dramatically undercut local representation. So, yeah, I think that there's a way to try to get to people uh, and say, I don't, it's not a matter of whether you are right or left. Do you think this is a way to make policy? You know, do you think this is right? Now, obviously, you know, there are links, you know, there are links between conservatives and liberals, there are links between the NDP and the liberals, and sometimes one can push a revolt within a party. And I think that there are many liberal party supporters right now who are very discouraged 
with the things that are going on. I think that they looked at the work that their government did when the liberals were in power provincially, and maybe they felt pretty good that they had managed to get a few things in place that they thought was a, was was advancing an environmental agenda. And now it's being trampled, you know, by this new government who does not have a mandate uh, to make these sorts of changes. Um, well, I mean, maybe the liberals didn't have a mandate either. Maybe that was the problem, right? Maybe if they had had to work together with another party where their policy would have had the stamp of more than 50% of Ontarians, maybe it would be a lot harder, you know, to do the kind of things that uh, that Ford is doing. But Ford's behavior is classic first past the post behavior, where you get into power on one set of promises, and then you basically ram through a bunch of policies most people don't want. And you hope that by the time the next election comes, people will have forgotten, won't be important, won't seem as, as terrible by that. And of course, that's what we've seen uh, happen again and again. I just want to back up what Dennis was saying. You know, some of these problems that we have, um, like our healthcare system is collapsing, just for example, you know, they aren't being made any better by the Ford government or whatever government you are in whatever province you are, which probably has a similar problem to what we have in Ontario because we're seeing this across the country. And so it may seem like whatever government you have, that they're, they're responsible for it. But these problems go back decades, decades of false majority governments, of politicians not being able to move ahead on important issues because they can't work together. And I had a very interesting conversation with a political scientist in Denmark. It was quite enlightening about a month ago, talking about how the parties in Denmark work together on some of these big issues and make long-term agreements on values, on policies that last well beyond elections. And that's what helps them keep um, going forward and be, have, be stronger when these crises hit, uh, whereas we're just in our spin cycle. Okay, so there, there are a ton more questions 825. Maybe I will take one more question. Um, this is an interesting question from Sabina. She is asking about Indigenous, uh, Indigenous vote. So how does support First Nations along an affirmative action plan that will provide reserved seats for them as in New Zealand? So if you could tie that in with the whole voting sure. reform movement, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Well, let me say just before I get to that, that I know it's frustrating sometimes at these sessions because, you know, we get so many questions and, you know, I, I can see like a, a dynamic chats going on in the chat. Um, and uh, and I, we appreciate you coming out tonight. This is I'm so, so thrilled to see so many people spend their Sunday night with me and Anita, um, you know, talking about our favorite topic. If you want to follow up on any of these things, you can always contact me through my institutional uh, account at York University. If you Google Dennis Pilon, you'll get my Academia EDU site where all my published work is. And uh, I, I welcome you, you know, your comments and questions. You know, I want to be a resource to you as the activists by providing whatever kinds of, of facts will help you beat up on our opponents. Uh, all right. On Indigenous representation, this is, of course, a very um, a challenging topic in the Canadian context. Um, obviously, we we must let Indigenous people lead uh, on these questions. Uh, some of them uh, want uh, more influence on the Canadian state. Some want to establish parallel uh, systems that operate, you know, in parallel to the governing structures that we have. And others want nothing to do with Canada and and don't want to engage with Canadian state. And, you know, at some point, we have to sort of honor all these different views that exist within the Indigenous communities. Um, however, there are some very exciting results that we've seen in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, New Zealand has a very complex system. They have and have had for over 100 years a set of reserved Maori seats. Now, initially, this was pretty much a way of marginalizing Indigenous people. In 1867, the Maori were almost a majority of the people in New Zealand. Uh, uh, but of course, they didn't want to let them vote uh, in the election because that would affect what the col col colonizers would do. Um, and so they set aside four seats out of a much larger house. And so what that meant was they were dramatically underrepresented. Now, over time, with immigration, population expansion, um, then the seats were sort of roughly in line with Maori numbers. And then in the 60s, um, Maori population started to increase again. And again, the four seats were a dramatic underrepresentation. When they moved to PR, they did two things that were really interesting. One was they changed the way the Maori role worked 
Now, depending on how many Maori register on the roll, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but depending on how many do, it affects the number of seats there will be. So now it's not limited to just four. Now it, it, it could be more. And you vote in one or the other. So if you register in the Maori seats, you vote in the Maori seats. If you don't register, you vote in the other seats. But at the same time, the PR system created a new dynamic amongst the parties. Prior to PR, only the Labour Party ran in the Maori seats. Only the Labour Party uh, uh, was, was, was in any way positive to the Maori issues. Uh, and they were the only ones to see to be competitive. With the introduction of PR, this created a new dynamic where now suddenly the other parties recognized, wait a minute, we could be more competitive. Instead of the Labour Party winning all the seats that were available to the Maori, um, and thus no incentive for the other parties to move in, now the proportional system, they did have an incentive. And they all took it up. So what we saw was that not only did, was there an increase in Maori representation, in part because of the increase in Maori seats, but also outside of the Maori seats. And with PR, every major party had elected Maori representatives. And over the period of time from the adoption of PR, the Maori went from being dramatically underrepresented in New Zealand society to actually being overrepresented. So today, they are very much in line with their proportion of the population. They have representation in all the parties. We could do the same thing in Canada. We could have reserved seats as an option uh, that allows uh, uh, Indigenous people to define for themselves that group, and but still allow uh, people who don't want to do that to vote anywhere they are. Don't forget, the majority of Indigenous people in Canada actually live in urban centers. And that means their influence in their vote is pretty much washed out by the non-Indigenous people. The only areas where they have an advantage is in some of the rural areas. And even there, they're not necessarily a majority of the population. So I think that PR is a natural fit with the justice aspirations around Indigenous politics, that we can do a better job of allowing Indigenous people to define whatever kind of representation they want uh, and have it work effectively with our existing institutions. So yes, I think that's a great, a great theme that we should be promoting uh, and 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 helping to facilitate that conversation. Okay, well, this has been an incredible session. We have covered so many topics that we could dive into um, in depth. I just want to, you know, give a shout out to everybody in Ontario uh, that we are seeing our issue come up in Ontario in by mainstream columnists who yeah. are pointing out that we don't actually have majority rule, and it's not just Andrew Coyne. Now, you know, we're seeing it come up more and more, and that is because of the work of people like everybody on this call. So we are making headway there. Um, I wanted to let everybody know, doesn't follow us closely, that we are this close to a breakthrough in the Yukon. So expect a fundraiser for me from me tomorrow um, to do some more advertising to reach voters in the Yukon. Every Every citizen in the Yukon is going to be sent a survey by the government where they will be asked if they would support a citizen's assembly on electoral reform. If we win the survey, win being a weird word for this, but basically if enough people respond to the government's dry, boring, technical and without context survey and say, yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea, then we will probably see a citizen's assembly on electoral reform in the Yukon, which is super exciting. So look for that, um, supporting our local team uh, to reach voters in your inbox. And we will have some exciting federal news coming up in January. I can't quite say what it is right now, but it's coming. Watch your inbox. Uh, we will be launching a federal campaign uh, that will be going gung-ho for the next six months all winter and through the spring. If you, when you leave this webinar, you'll go to a donation page. If you wanna see us do more of this stuff, Donate. We rely on monthly voters. Monthly voters. We rely on monthly donors. We rely on individuals. We rely on volunteers. Guess what? Government doesn't fund us. Uh, nobody funds us other than individuals. So we need that support. Feel free to volunteer. Get involved. Uh, we need you. Um, and I think that is it. I just want to thank everyone for taking their time with us tonight. Thank Dennis for taking his time. And uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for your support for Federal Canada and proportional representation. Oh, last thing, if you registered, which obviously you did, everybody who registered, I'll send them a link to this video that you can share uh, with anybody you like. In about two days, you'll find it on our YouTube channel, channel under the webinar playlist. And I understand that Zoom has done a 
thing now where they don't let you save the chat. Uh, they, their tech guy says they don't let attendees save the chat anymore on webinars. So if you want a copy of the whole chat that you all had, just ask me because I get a copy of it and I'm happy to send it to anybody. And on that, we'll say good night. All right. Thanks.